Statistics and Associate Minister for Finance. And I would also like to welcome our Q&A panel, Angela Mentis, CEO of the Bank of New Zealand, Matt Winneray, CEO of New Zealand Superfund, Marty McBride, CEO of CDSB, and Martin Wilder, founding partner of Pollination Group. Um, and I'd like to introduce our partner, Wendy McGuinness from the McGuinness Institute, who will close the session and also to acknowledge the other partners to the roundtable, Simpson Grierson and CDSB and uh, Pollination Group for hosting. And finally, a big thank you to the officers of Mark Carney, Governor Orr and Minister Shaw. The title of this roundtable is Near Horizon, Seizing the Opportunities and Managing the Risks in the Transition to Net Zero, the Importance of Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. This title was inspired by a whakatauki, or a Māori proverb about travel at sea, the Māori being, people being a, a voyaging people that Trevor Moiki reminded us of. Ko ngā pai tāwhiti whaia ki a tāta, ko ngā pai tāta whakamaua ki a tina. And what it says is, pursue distant horizons that they draw near. For all the near horizon and opportunity, seize them. In this round table, we're seeking to seize this near horizon, this opportunity to consider mandatory disclosure of climate related risk. Last year, led by Minister Shaw, the Aotearoa New Zealand government passed the Zero Carbon Act. This act is a policy framework for decarbonizing Aotearoa New Zealand's economy and taking it to net zero emissions by 2050. To manage Aotearoa New Zealand's transition to a low carbon future, every professional financial decision must take climate change into account. Tonight, we're discussing how we manage this transition and we ask how essential is disclosure in achieving this? So let's begin. We'll now hear from our speakers. Firstly, Mark, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Minister Shaw, uh, my old friend, uh, Governor Orr, it is a great honor to uh, join this panel. And let me say that um, it was only about nine months ago I was in the audience at uh, the General Assembly uh, where your prime minister started with an honest appraisal of some of the challenges that uh, New Zealand faces uh, in achieving um, uh, net zero, but also the determination to do so. Um, and it wasn't just talk, um, just Mark just uh, referenced uh, the climate change law, uh, the strengthening of the emission trading scheme, uh, the uh, 100 uh, million green investment fund and on, all material steps. Now finance uh, will play a central role uh, in um, seizing the opportunities and also managing the risks um, as we move to net zero. And again, uh, it's good to see New Zealand out in front. Um, we need uh, a whole of economy transition. Net zero will not be achieved in a niche. Um, and uh, that is one of the reasons why we need comprehensive disclosure. Um, in fact, we think that, uh, and in, in our work on private finance for COP, uh, what we're going to focus on is three R's, reporting, which is disclosure, today's topic, uh, also risk management, using that information in order, uh, particularly by banks and insurers in order to manage the risks around the transition, particularly the transition to net zero, um, but also returns. Uh, in other words, seizing those opportunities, seeing which country, uh, companies rather uh, are the lead leaders, which ones are the laggards in, uh, in that transition and where value can be created. So let me focus um, principally on that first star today's topic, uh, tonight's topic uh, on reporting. Um, of course, we all know uh, the old adage is what measured uh, is what gets managed. Um, the TCFD uh, launched uh, really just uh, a little over, um, well, completed about three years ago, launched about five years ago, uh, a private sector voluntary led uh, initiative. So catalyzed by the public sector, but run by the private sector. So it's disclosure um, uh, standards developed by the private sector for the use of the providers of capital. Um, and it's suitable for all companies across all sectors uh, who look to raise capital, whether it's through borrowing or, or uh, direct investing. Um, it establishes consistent and comparable metrics. It provides guidance about the governance and risk management uh, around climate related risk. Um, and it encourages a forward looking perspective, obviously essential to managing these risks and taking the opportunities through something called scenario analysis. And I'll touch a bit more uh, on that. Now, since the standards were first published three years ago, so they were concluded for the Hamburg G20 summit th uh, three years ago. Um, the support for them has skyrocketed. Uh, uh, we have uh, 
most of the major asset managers, uh, largest funds, including people like the super fund, um, uh, major CEOs, et cetera, but 140 billion trillion rather, sorry, I'm losing my numbers here, 140 trillion of balance sheet across those banks, insurers, asset managers that are backing TCF disclosures. So huge demand for this. Uh, the supply is starting to come. In other words, the supply of that disclosure uh, is starting to come. Uh, about four fifths of the top 1100 companies across uh, the G20 provide uh, material TCF fee disclosure, um, but it's not yet quite comprehensive. And that goes to part of the reason why we think it is now time uh, for mandatory uh, disclosure. Um, in other words, the standards have matured. Um, there has been a few iterations of providing this disclosure. Um, so they're getting more refined. But secondly, the issue is uh, about making sure the coverage is as comprehensive as possible. Um, I think everyone who's familiar with this area will, will recognize that there are some issues with multiple standards, uh, for example, around uh, ESG uh, metrics, there's over a thousand of those. Uh, that can lead to confusion and uh, potential for greenwashing. Um, there is some unevenness in terms of the application of uh, climate disclosure standards across sectors and even within sectors. So we'd like uh, to have the comprehensive uh, coverage, both quantity and quality, so that providers of capital uh, can make uh, the necessary decisions. Um, let me just touch on two other things uh, in the time I have and uh, make sure we have time for uh, the other speakers and for questions. Um, I said this uh, reporting is one of three R's that we see as the foundations of what Mark referenced at the start, which is that every professional financial decision can take climate change into account. Um, and that is the objective of COP26, the finance work for COP26. The two other pillars there, risk management, uh, Governor Orr and the Reserve Bank are part of something called the NGFS. It's a group of 60 central banks. Uh, including the Bank of England, uh, People's Bank of China, other major central banks. Um, and what that group is doing is developing both supervisory approaches for banks and insurers and stress testing approaches. Uh, so forward-looking approaches using climate disclosure, helping banks and insurers develop the risk management capabilities that will be necessary uh, to manage um, through the transition. And the final pillar is around return. It's really around seizing those opportunities. I'll just say one word of context here, which is um, uh, New Zealand uh, has led in many things. It's also led in the management of uh, the COVID crisis to your great credit. Um, but one of the things that the COVID crisis teaches us, apart from the fact that we can't wish away systemic risks, including like climate change, is that um, so many variables or so many um, economic drivers have now shifted, um, whether it's localization of supply chains, um, uh, the acceleration of the shift from moving atoms to moving bits, e-learning, e-health, other aspects, or just the sheer weight of debt uh, that's being put on companies and countries as a part of the response. All of that means that companies are going to have to adapt their strategies to those new realities. Um, this is a huge opportunity. There are 125 countries including the UK, Canada, New Zealand, um, who have net zero as a target. As companies shift their strategies, it is entirely reasonable. Indeed, um, I would suggest it's untenable for them not to do this, which is it's entirely reasonable for them to outline their transition strategies from where they are as companies uh, to how they're gonna get to net zero by 2050. Um, that presents a huge opportunity and we can use the disclosure framework uh, as a foundation for that information and for the providers of capital to take that um, and manage accordingly. I think I'm just coming to being out of time. So Mark, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Very much looking forward to uh, the other comments and uh, to the Q&A, thanks. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, Adrian, I'll now hand over you and ask you to, uh, to speak. Adrian, you're uh, on mute. Amateur hour. Tulai Falava, Tenakato Kato. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Mark and Mark. Um, I do want to thank the McInnes Institute for bringing this together, Simpson Grayson, and of course the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. Um, it is an incredibly important discussion. 
Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, Mr. Carney, you shook us all awake with your speech breaking the tragedy of the horizons back in 2015. And I know the Honourable James Shaw was actually in the audience for that speech. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, our Minister um, for Climate Change. Um, thank you for your leadership, your financial expertise and your personal commitment and courage to, um, to this uh, very, very difficult challenge that we have. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Carney, um, five years ago when um, we provided the speech, everyone was wondering what has this got to do at all with uh, the financial markets, particularly central banks and the, and the dry business of regulating and promoting financial stability. And now, as, as Mark mentioned, uh, it is the most common activity across all central banks in the world and financial regulators wondering how we can best um, be part of managing the transition into a low carbon future, seeing it as a true risk. So, um, so well done, everyone. I'll talk very briefly on three issues. One, why does climate change matter to the central bank, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand? What are we actually doing about it? And what are some of the opportunities, just as Mark touched on at the end, of using this heinous COVID-19 pandemic position to our advantage um, going forward? Uh, a real challenge. At the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, Te Putia Matua, um, we use the Māori legend of Tani Mahuta to talk about where we fit into the economic system. Tani Mahuta has is, is, uh, been given the great honour of having separated Mother Earth, Papa Tuanuku, and uh, the Sky Father Ranganui apart to let the sun shine in to the environment and to let things flourish. Uh, Tani Mahuta then became the kaitiaki, the guardian of that ecosystem. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand, well, uh, we're the guardian of the financial ecosystem here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And just uh, as part of that, we recognise the importance of that sunshine being allowed in. And I'm going to come back to that. Uh, looking in our kaitiaki role, we... Uh, very, very used to assessing risks, both for individual firms, but also for the financial system as a whole. And we need to promote financial stability. And we think about financial stability when uh, the risks have been adequately identified, um, they may be priced, and through that pricing allocated to people who can best manage those financial risks. Climate change is a direct challenge to that financial stability. The risks to climate change are incredibly hard to identify in the near term. There is no real market for pricing and hence no real reward for any one individual to be managing the risk. And often the risk is held by those people who are least able to manage it, i.e. that has not been allocated. So in the economic jargon, the market failure is rife. Uh, what it means for us is that disclosure is critically important. Firm disclosure allows the risks to be identified. It may not be perfect, but um, as Mr. Carney mentioned, what gets measured gets managed, and it's better to measure something imperfectly and manage it rather than just to assume it away, to ignore it. Uh, we know that there are significant implications for uh, the New Zealand economy and New Zealand society through climate change, whether it's through the physical challenge, um, sea level rising, uh, adverse weather, um, interrupting key economic activities and, and society as a whole, as well as the transition challenges that we have, um, as our Prime Minister outlined, um, heading towards the zero carbon world. You can get there very abruptly. Um, we don't want to do that. We want a smooth transition. Um, and some of those transmission, uh, transition challenges are already with us. So I, I think of our traditional agriculture staring down the, the, the face of Three risks, um, the emission pricing, they're saying, why us? Uh, changes in consumer behaviour, people perhaps preferring uh, plant-based protein, and of course, more extreme weather. So these risks are real um, for some people. What are we doing at the Reserve Bank about it? Well, we're incorporating the impact of climate change right into our core functions, our monetary policy, but also our assessment of financial stability. It is a key question that we ask in whenever we're doing our activity now. We also are managing our own direct impact on the climate. You, you certainly don't want to um, 
um, throw stones from a glass house. So we're making sure that we are doing our bit and we're hoping to be able to lead through collaboration and the experience that we're picking up internationally, particularly through um, our, our fellow global regulators. Uh, for us, disclosure sits at the core of all three of those avenues. Disclosure from firms of, of what the climate change risks they have and how they are managing them is critical for changing the game. What, what I like about it, sorry, I would say it's more changes the rules of the game. It doesn't change the game itself. It allows firms to better understand the risks they hold and then better be able to manage them. And likewise, investors to be able to both uh, alter their portfolios uh, and take opportunities around um, climate uh, emissions reduction and climate adaptation. Even then, beyond disclosure, what we've found here in New Zealand is that leadership is still needed. And so I thank you, uh, Mr. James Shaw, uh, our own survey at the Reserve Bank of Insurers and Banks last year found that there was a broad agreement around the concerns and the risks that climate change can bring. But I have to say there was scant evidence of that concern changing business decisions. Part of that might be because disclosure and, and the awareness of the climate change was pretty thin. Two thirds of the banks we surveyed had some form of disclosure on climate change risks, but only one third of the insurers. And hence partial information, uh, ability to um, you know, kink the playing field and poor information leading to misinformed decisions. This is why we take uh, the uh, disclosure as being critical. And we are very happy to support um, compulsory disclosure. Uh, we want to support compulsory disclosure, hopefully in collaboration with the firms and businesses who will be doing that disclosure. It needs to be effective, uh, it needs to be meaningful, and to do that we need the standardisation that Mr Carney talked about around the types of risks, the scenario tests, and also the way in which we aggregate and utilise that information to make better decisions. What else are we doing? Well, no surprise, we're stepping up our supervision activities, particularly around the climate related risks and our financial institutions are aware of that. Uh, we've been working very hard. I would say that any of the firms who are not providing any disclosure on climate risks should just hurry up and do so. Um, and we will certainly be um, chasing that through. We're also working with all of the other financial regulators in New Zealand um, under this umbrella called the Council of Financial Regulators to have a more collective uh, view so that there are no gaps. We can move as a single entity and we are training our supervisors around the, the, uh, the growing art of climate disclosure. Uh, as mentioned, we're working with the Network for the Greening of the Financial System. There's now 66 central banks, financial institutions, uh, supervisory agencies, uh, regulatory agencies around the world working on this coordinated response to climate change. So it's not, it's not a local hobby horse. We are actually just joining the party. People are always kind to say New Zealand's ahead of the game. I don't feel we are in the regulatory space. We are playing rapid catch up. We're small, nimble, so I'm sure we'll get there. <coughs> and finally, uh, we're looking at our own activities, in particular our own balance sheet. What do we need to be doing in managing the nation's uh, foreign reserves, um, foreign assets, and how are we exposed both within that portfolio to climate change risks, but more importantly, how can we use that portfolio in our regular business to promote broader adaptation and climate change within our financial system institutions? I do hope to be able to talk more about that in the future. Um, finally, you know, what is this opportunity about COVID-19? Um, well, it's hardly an opportunity. It is a heinous situation that we're in and the economic impacts are coming through. And we know there's gonna be a massive rebuild, a, a massive desire for fiscal stimulation, continued purchasing of assets. Uh, and I think the Economist magazine nailed it on the head as they do. Um, they said, following the pandemic is like watching climate change with your finger on the fast forward button. Uh, it's a critical acute issue, the COVID-19, uh, so is climate change. New Zealand has shown its ability to suddenly rally together and, and work very, very consistently towards a good outcome. And I think this is our opportunity around the climate change uh, 
issue to really work together and be global best. I'll finish just back on the sunshine. Tony Mahuta, I said, was being um, the uh, the tree god um, who let the sunshine in. Disclosure is the sunshine in the financial markets. It allows better decisions to be made. And if we want to remove that tragedy of the horizons, better decisions need to be made right now. Mo taki mato. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and now we'll move on to, to James, Minister Shaw. Um, I just want to say to uh, both Mark and Adrian, thank you very much for your comments um, and Mark in particular uh, for beaming in from uh, halfway around the world uh, to be with us. Um, there's over a thousand people uh, on the seminar tonight, which is a sign of uh, huge support uh, for uh, what is a very significant move, um, but it is quite a niche uh, topic in the general climate change policy space. So to have this uh, level of interest, I think is uh, tremendously gratifying. Um, and I wanna thank you for, for your participation in it. I do also just wanna thank um, Wendy uh, McGuinness from the McGuinness Institute, Mark Baker-Jones um, and the team there. So uh, for pulling all of this together. Um, as Adrian mentioned, I was actually sitting at the back of the room uh, in the convention center in Paris uh, in the run-up to the signing of the Paris Agreement, where uh, Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg were launching the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, and I, I think I may have read uh, Mark's article earlier that year um, and, and got a sense that there was something going on, uh, but wasn't really uh, sort of aware of the momentum behind it. Um, but it, it was a very significant event. Uh, and the language really surprised me. So uh, one of the things um, that Mark talked about back then was uh, something he, he repeated tonight, which is that in their estimation, there are literally trillions of dollars of unquantified, undisclosed, uh, and therefore unmanaged risk sitting on corporate balance sheets around the world. And that is uh, due to uh, risks related to climate change. And, and that is a startling notion. Um, and so I've sort of carried that. And uh, I'm really delighted that we're in a position now where um, we're able to consider uh, possibly putting in place a mandatory um, uh, climate related uh, risk disclosure system for New Zealand. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that because uh, obviously Mark and Adrian have um, uh, obviously given us the, the business case for why it's significant. Um, uh, you know, New, New Zealand, of course, you know, one of the things that we often say about ourselves is we have underdeveloped capital markets. Um, it's a small economy. Uh, and so some of these kind of global trends, uh, we often sort of say, well, that's not really relevant to our particular situation. They don't pass us by. But actually, when you look at it, New Zealand is as exposed as any other um, country, a developed country, uh, in terms of the nature of our economy and the kinds of risks that could uh, pop up. Um, we're currently going through another one in one, uh, one in seventy year drought uh, up in Northland and uh, on the east um, Cape of New Zealand, um, and and that is roughly the uh, fourth time in the last ten years that we've had one in seventy year droughts. Um, so the frequency and the severity of uh, of droughts is occurring. Um, we've had our own fire events. They're nothing compared to the ones that happened in Australia over the summer, of course, um, but there has been. Uh, you know, sort of more intense fires um, at the top of the North Island and a couple of years ago uh, outside of Christchurch in the Port Hills. Um, and of course, we are probably m more significantly seeing uh, an upswing in the frequency and severity of storms uh, in New Zealand that collectively cause uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of damage, um, whether that's to uh, rural and agricultural areas or to uh, urban centres. Um, so, it, you know, we are kind of feeling the effects and those do have a material impact on, on businesses. The um, 2013 drought, I think, wiped something like $1.5 billion off our agricultural exports. Uh, and um, Victoria University's team found that, you know, there was uh, a definite increase in the severity and length of that drought uh, because of the effects of climate change. So uh, it is 
significant. There are risks that uh, New Zealand businesses and organisations are exposed to. Uh, and obviously, we also know that um, our own industries and businesses are, you know, are in many cases part of the problem because we also emit uh, greenhouse gases as we go about our business and, and uh, perform the kinds of economic activities that we do. So we do need to manage both sides of that, managing the um, risks of the effects of climate change, but also um, managing down uh, the impact that we have uh, on, on the problem. So in October of last year, uh, our government put out a, a consultation document on proposals to in introduce a mandatory comply or explain uh, reporting uh, regime for um, uh, climate related disclosures. Uh, and there were some key questions that we asked. So we suggested at the time that all asset owners, all asset managers, banks, insurers, and listed issuers uh, would be required to complete these disclosures on a mandatory basis in line with the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures recommendations. Um, we also proposed that those disclosures would be made as part of your mainstream uh, financial filings, so not sitting off to one side as a, a, a kind of a you know a, a separate report or a nice to have, but integrated into uh, the um, financial reporting of the business. Uh, we proposed that disclosing entities would have a one-year transition period because we understand that this is still very early days, uh, and uh, you know. We don't necessarily have the capability to be able to do full reports, uh, so partial compliance um, would obviously be uh, permissible as a stepping stone towards full compliance. Um, and because it's mandatory, there would obviously also be a clear role for government uh, and for regulators in relation to guidance, education, uh, monitoring and reporting of the above. So we put that out, in, out into the marketplace and said, what do you think? Um, and the, uh, the sort of results of that came um, through back in about late February. Uh, now, of course, there was quite a lot of other things going on in late February, such as declaring a nation nationwide state of emergency and moving into total lockdown um, over the course of February and March. Uh, so um, we've sort of parked it up uh, since then, but we're now obviously um, appear to be coming out the other side of that. Um, so what I can say is that 84% of the respondents agreed that the TCFD framework was appropriate for New Zealand. That's an astonishingly high uh, number. 77% of respondents supported requiring large investors and listed companies to do uh, um, disclosures on, on TCFD. Uh, and um, in fact, came back and said, well, it shouldn't just be listed businesses as well, but actually some of our um, largest emitters are um, either public entities or are privately held companies. Um, and so some of the su suggestions that we got back uh, in the feedback was that it, it actually, there should, the, the materiality line should really be the scale of the organization, not whether or not it's a um, publicly listed company or not. Uh, and so um, that's that will be one of the considerations as we move towards policy decisions, uh, hopefully later this year. Um, I just want to mention the role of the External Reporting Board, um, the XRB, uh, which is a, a New Zealand body that we've got um, that um, does uh, external reporting standards. Uh, they do assurance uh, and guidance, and they've got a long history in, in developing reporting standards uh, in New Zealand across a, a wide variety of uh, matters. And so um, they are uh, going to be important players in this. Um, I understand that the XRB is quite keen to uh, take a lead in developing climate-related uh, and integrated reporting standards for New Zealand, um, and our government's quite keen to support them in that. And so um, we've asked officials from the Ministry for the Environment uh, and our um, Economic Development Ministry to engage actively with them uh, to support that work um, in, in developing climate and integrated reporting standards for New Zealand. So I have to say, um, just in closing, that I, I was really delighted with the level of support that we had for the proposals. Um, often when you, you know, when a government says uh, to the private sector, hey, uh, how would you like some more reporting and make it compulsory, you know, you tend to get a negative response um, for, you know, entirely understandable reasons. But I think that there is a real realization out there that, that this is a, uh, a clear and present danger. It is a very material risk. Um, and uh, investors and directors definitely want to know, um, and managers definitely want to know, 
what risks they are exposed to, their businesses are exposed to. Why, why wouldn't you want to know uh, what those what those risks are, um, so that you can sort of start to work out a plan for mitigating and managing those uh, those risks down. Um, and and so the fact that the private sector is so supportive of this, uh, I think, is really helpful. Um, it makes it a lot easier for a government to make an affirmative decision uh, when we get to that point. For those who are on the call, uh, all 1,022 of you, uh, I would ask that when we get to that point, um, please stay actively engaged because it would be good uh, for those of you who are who are supportive of, of this proposal um, to, to, to be involved and to, to actively support it as we get to the uh, decision-making point around that. Um, but in the meantime, um, uh, as we get to that point, like I said, I think the XRB uh, are quite keen to sort of start working with that process um, uh, with um, uh, you know, Mark Baker Jones and Wendy McGuinness and others in New Zealand who are really kind of leading on this at the moment uh, to uh, to develop those standards. Um, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much for being here, um, and thank you for your engagement with um, this really significant uh, the significant move. Thank you very much, uh, James, for that. I think I think when we went to we started broadcasting, we had over two thousand people now. Um, now watching the, uh, the podcast, so fantastic. Um, we're gonna move into the second part of the uh, round table now, and that's where we're asking our panel to ask questions. So Angela, can we start with you? Thank you, Antenna Katoa Katoa. And thank you very much, uh, Mark, for being with us, Minister Shaw and, and Governor Orr. So Mark, I might ask uh, you the first question, please. So greater transparency of a bank's exposure to climate-related risks and opportunities in its portfolio through TCFD reporting and public commitments is one mechanism for banks to be part of the solution to achieve a net zero economy. For example, the NAB Group, of which the BNZ is a part of, has begun reporting against the TCFD framework and has committed to 70 billion of environment financing by 2025 to help address climate change. Another mechanism is to encourage is to encourage sustainable finance by way of capital relief. There is a great deal of discussion globally about this possibility, notably in the EU, where one trillion euro of capital needs to be mobilized to address climate change. Given capital settings ultimately have a basis in risk, both the positive and negative, ESG risks associated with lending could be a highly effective way to signal and ultimately drive changes in capital allocation. Mark, what are your thoughts on this? And are there any informative examples in offshore markets you could discuss? Sure, thank you very much, Angie. Let me give you, um, I'll give you a specific example, um, but then I, I wanna step back and generalize it. Um, because as, as you noted in your question, and you would, you would live, um, and Adrian lives uh, in his current role, uh, the governor lives in his current role, um, you know, from a, from a prudential regulator perspective, so central bank is a prudential regulator, it is about risk. It's about actual um, prudential risk or credit risk of a, of, of a loan, let's say in this, uh, in this case. And that risk can be affected by physical uh, manifestations of climate change. Uh, the minister just referenced uh, uh, the drought, unfortunately, um, uh, but it also can be uh, affected by the trans so-called transition risk or legal risk around it. So as climate policy changes, uh, certain businesses become advantaged, others uh, disadvantaged if companies can't change their strategy and a loan can go, go poorly. From our perspective as a prudential regulator when I was, when I was that, um, it is really about that risk as opposed to making climate policy using uh, capital, uh, capital policy or capital relief or uh, risk-based capital standards, different words for the same thing as you can appreciate. Um, uh, but the, 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 what the insight we've had in recent years has been to anticipate that when society, when New Zealand says it's going to net zero and passes that uh, objective and starts to implement policies consistent with moving that way, uh, is to ask the questions of the banks, have you thought through the implications for your loan book, not just in the next six months, but let's say the next six years, 10 years, et cetera, as this transition goes. And do you have a strategy that's consistent with that? Um, and that's part of what stress testing of banks gets to, which is to, and, and it's one of the things the Bank of England is doing, a number of other central banks are going to do, which is to look at how the loan book evolves over time 
if we're serious about what we say we're going to do, we as countries are say we're going to do. Um, that's my general answer. I'm now going to flip to a specific case, which is that what we have seen uh, in the UK is that even controlling for other factors in mortgage lending, for example, so controlling for region, controlling for income, uh, other credit factors, uh, we actually have found that there is material outperformance, um, better performance of uh, greener mortgages in the UK. So actually, but, but that's just, hap that happens to be the case, if you will, and therefore it gets incorporated into uh, the risk weights of those uh, mortgages in, in a, almost a conventional sense. Uh, so uh, ultimately, and I'll finish on this, climate policy is the responsibility of governments. It's the responsibility of people like such as the minister and uh, governments have passed through that. The job of uh, the central banks and ultimately the private banks is to anticipate where that's going and to manage the risks that arise as a consequence uh, of that. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Angie. Um, Matt, can I hand over to you? Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got one for Mark as well. I'm sorry to come back to Mark uh, again. Actually, I'm sort of slightly disappointed because my impression of Mark was that he always wore black tie because I've just uh, watched the Lloyd's uh, speech a number of times, but I'm, I'm pleased to see that he's gone casual for us here. Um, Mark, uh, specifically around the application or implementation of the TCFD, when you talk to entities that uh, are going to be required or are required to disclose, what are their what what are the impediments? What do they see that gets in the way? Uh, I'm interested in that because uh, I'm interested in in how Minister Shaw might be able to, uh, when he gets to implementing it here, uh, deal with those particular issues. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, after 11 uh, in the morning, I change into my black tie. Uh, Matt, you have to uh, you have to adjust for the uh, time difference here in the UK. Um, the um, and it's good. Also, I, I never age, I guess, if you continue to watch the same one. <laughs> um, no, the the biggest thing uh, in terms of implementation, um, and this is one of the is one of the elements that makes the TCFD unique, uh, which is um, scenario analysis or so the forward looking element of that form of disclosure. So, you know, histor historically, almost all disclosure is, uh, other types of disclosure, as you know, Matt, is, um, is, is static. It's, um, you know, what are my assets? What are my liabilities today? As opposed to what's the impact on my business in certain climate scenarios. Um, and one of the things that's been missing, uh, one of the challenges in providing scenario analysis for companies has been what scenario to use. Um, and, um, uh, and I think actually this is where the central banks can play a service uh, because for the stress tests um, that we're going to conduct, we need to conduct scenarios. And, and, and I'll just spend a second on what those scenarios are, would be. Uh, there's the, you know, the one we all want, which is a relatively smooth transition from where we are today to net zero. So gradual adjustments to climate policy that bring uh, investment and uh, responses and, and, and stable macroeconomic outcomes. Um, there's the uh, Minsky type scenario, which is we leave it too late and then we have to make quite a sharp adjustment. Um, and you have big transition risk in that second scenario because all of a sudden uh, the minister referenced trillions of dollars of potentially stranded assets. That's where you really see stranded assets in that scenario. And then the third scenario is the business as usual, do nothing type approach and where physical risks and physical manifestations of climate change just ramp up. And that's where we're really seeing the, uh, the risks, which uh, many other problems with that. Um, so what we're doing as part of these stress tests is we're developing coherent scenarios for each of those. So not just a path of climate policy, but what are the potential macroeconomic feedbacks of those? Um, and then we will release those, um, the central banks rather will release those uh, through the NGFS, and they'll be open source. So companies, uh, asset uh, owners, uh, asset managers, uh, banks can draw them down, adapt them, and use it accordingly. So it's um, uh, the, the short answer to your question, and it's a bit late for a short answer uh, to it now, uh, but the short answer is that it's the forward-looking element that's uh, uh, the biggest issue. Uh, 
Um, there's some variance amongst uh, different sectors in terms of the other elements, uh, but they're all uh, they're all addressable uh, variants. You know, some people are a little less open about uh, whether compensation is tied to climate outcomes or other governance aspects. But um, and then I think I, I will add one final point. Uh, the minister mentioned it, and I think it is important, is having that disclosure in the standard financial reports. So you're not hunting around, you're not having to scrape the website. Uh, it's apples to apples comparisons across uh, companies, uh, across sectors. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, Marty, can I hand over to you for a question? Thanks, Mark. And my question's for Adrian. Um, Adrian, the reason that Mark has called for the establishment of the, the TCFD is to address the hidden risks of climate change that exist in the financial system at firm level, but also from a systemic financial stability perspective, which of course is, is your department uh, as governor of the Reserve Bank New Zealand. So if, uh, if Minister Shaw is successful and the TCFD recommendations become mandatory, and my fingers are crossed tightly, and you had firm level information on climate risk available to you across the board, how would this help you in your job of ensuring financial stability in New Zealand? Um, thank you, Marty, and it's a great question. And I think the short answer before I give you a long one is it would help immensely. Um, it helps immensely in the sense that um, uh, we suddenly have data and useful data that we can work with both around uh, understanding the macroeconomic implications, so aggregating up, and using it for our monetary policy purposes. Um, you know, there's impacts on the ability for the country to supply parts of land or different activities have been taken out. And likewise, aggregate demand is seriously impacted through all sorts of adverse conditions. So, so it helps us um, work our way through that. The simple drought in Northland and parts of the East Coast at the moment is a classic example. Um, the second part is that it, it helps us, as, as what Mr. Carney was just talking about, um, to bring life to those uh, stress test scenarios and to have engaged conversations with the financial institutions, both the banks, but especially the insurance um, people to talk about, we can see it, can you see it, what are you doing about it, how is that being managed, how is that being priced, and, you know, I'm back to the sunshine, it brings the transparency in, into the whole action. And, of course, we can see whether we are improving on the way through at time and it gives our supervisors who will be the new highly trained climate disclose uh, experts um, you know real tangible things to bring up with the ceos and managers of the banks um, just while i've got the microphone as well and, and sorry I, I just want to go back to angela's question around using risk weights i will remind the audience that um, uh, globally the risk weights are, are always trying to be standard internationally through the, through that, that very dynamic group in Switzerland, the, the, the Basel um, Standards Committees. Uh, but that doesn't stop individual banks or financial institutions anywhere in the world still disclosing what they're doing and showing leadership. And likewise, for the advanced banks, of which I know the um, NAB, BNZ is, it doesn't stop them from looking at their own risk weighting uh, data and assessing whether there is a material difference between brown assets, green assets, and how are they thinking that through? So showing that leadership. Don't wait for the slowest common denominator called the single global regulator. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, Martin, over to you. Sorry to take it off mute. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I've got a question for Minister Shaw. So um, I think at the moment we are seeing many governments around the world tying in the need for COVID recovery with obviously the move to a green economy. And interestingly, the Canadian government said, if you're a company over a certain size and you would like to receive COVID assistance, you need to be doing TCFD reporting. Um, so I think in that sense, um, one of the things that we often hear from companies, which is really not acceptable, is that we're doing TCFD light. You know, they think they can just do it at a light way and it's where it's in fact you have to do TCFD properly. So I think from your perspective, um, obviously being an advocate of moving for mandatory TCFD, um, in terms of trying to ensure that companies and the people you're regulating apply TCFD in a more coherent way. And also I noticed one of the questions that was up on the on the chat was about to what extent would New Zealand move beyond just listed entities and that's this provision for trying to do that. Just appreciate your thoughts around both the issue of 
of making sure that TCFD is actually implemented properly and then how far and how deep in the economy you implement that. Great. Thanks, Martin. Um, and nice to see you again. Um, I uh, So the, the consultation that came back um, was quite strongly in favour of actually a broader catchment than the one that we had proposed uh, when we went out. So we, I think, like I said, we, when we went out, we suggested asset owners, asset managers, banks, insurers, and listed issuers. Um, and, and actually what the feedback that we got was um, yes, and um, essentially organisations over a certain size, and and that could actually include government agencies, um, which you know, given that I'm in a sort of governance role in relation to uh, some government agencies, it, it did occur to me that I would want to know that. <laughs> uh, what you know, what are my agencies exposed to in terms of their um, kind of future risk? Are we managing that effectively as well, right? And and that's not because I'm an investor or our owner, but simply because I am in a governance position with them. So I have some sympathy for uh, for that view, um, and also, of course there's a leadership role for government here as well, right? So I, I think that I think that's significant. You can't, can't understate that. And also the view came back as well, which is that um, some of it, probably are what you might describe as our riskiest uh, entities, companies are, are actually privately held or um, they're state-owned enterprises um, or at least partially state-owned enterprises. And so therefore um, they actually also ought to be uh, in, involved in this as well. Because why, why as an economy, um, and you know, looking at someone like Adrian, who's got to manage risk across the economy as a whole, why would he want to leave big black spots, um, particularly when you've got the kind of particular and peculiar um, uh, kind of market capitalization makeup that we that we have here in New Zealand? Um, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to. Know, you wouldn't want that. Um, at the other end, you've got you know Matt Winneray, who's uh, in charge of our super fund, um, and because he owns everything, he's going to want to know that as well. So, um, the, you know, it, it, it actually does make sense from, from an investment perspective and a governance perspective uh, for, it, for it to go broader. So that will be, uh, I guess, one of the proposals or one of the considerations that when we get around to policy decisions uh, later in the year that, that we'll have to seriously consider. Um, but you started the question, remind me, Martin, you started the question in a slightly different place. Yes, sorry, just take it. Yeah, so the question was that you're now looking at obviously recovery in the New Zealand economy, and there's a lot of That's right. restrictions about the connection between yeah. COVID and the green economy. And the Europeans last night released their green economy package. So obviously, TCFD is crucial in that. So just your thinking around tying this all together more broadly. Yeah. Um... So I have a lot of sympathy for that view. I think that the Canadians uh, think it makes a lot of sense. If you're pouring tens of billions of dollars uh, into the economy and frankly into private entities, uh, then um, there at the very least needs to be some form of quid pro quo uh, and an alignment with long-term economic strategy should be uh, a very important consideration. Um, having TCFD reporting for those entities that we're uh, becoming financially engaged with, <laughs> shall I say, um, is not something that cabinet has considered. Um, it's certainly something that I would be advocating. Um, I mean, anybody who's been on in this audience would know that over the last few weeks, I have been saying repeatedly that I think that it is an absolute necessity that the recovery is a, you know, a kind of a green recovery in the sense that we're currently borrowing tens of billions of dollars off our children and grandchildren uh, who are going to be paying for this through their taxes. And therefore, um, if we don't uh, do a green recovery, if we just sort of focus on resuscitating the, the old economy that we had 10 weeks ago, uh, then we're going to, they're going to end up paying for it twice uh, because they're going to be paying the, you know, the debt that got us through this recovery, but they'll also be paying uh, for the, cost of transition and adaptation due to climate change um, and other risks. So we have an absolute duty to make sure that every dollar that we spend to, to, to the maximum extent that we can resolve some of those long-term challenges, not just deals with the short term. Otherwise we're being frankly, financially deeply irresponsible. And I noticed when I asked that question about TCFD, like Mark was nodding his head, I'm just interested Mark in your thoughts about this issue of companies who say, we're going to do apply TCFD in a light way, which is really not applying it at all. 
Yeah, it's, um, I think the key thing is that right now is, um, I wouldn't say nothing's ever final, final, but it's, uh, it's all but final uh, review of the TCFD by that private sector entity uh, or privately led entity, a uh, group of companies that are a part of that framework. Um, and so if companies have a view that there's certain um, reporting uh, recommendations as part of the TCFD that are too onerous, um, or if the providers of capital have a view, and this would be quite helpful that there's just information that isn't quote, and this is an American term, but it's useful, decision useful. Um, so they don't actually use that information in making the capital allocation decision. Um, I think feeding that in through the TCFD, and if anyone wants the contacts, uh, we can provide them. Um, I'm, I'm sure Baker McKenzie has those contacts, but we can provide the contacts at the TCFD um, for companies as things get refined. Let me say one other thing, though, just while I have the floor, which is, um, you know, New Zealand's out there leading. Um, uh, you're, you're not alone. Um, uh, you know, the FCA um, in the UK is uh, is consulting right now on comply or explain TCFD uh, disclosure. Uh, there's a reference. Uh, you made a reference to. Uh, uh, the Canadian uh, government uh, for the large companies under the COVID um, having TCFD mandatory uh, in that case. You, there is going to be a lot more of that, uh, we know, uh, in uh, the coming. Um, but also part of the process we're looking to run for COP is um, to uh, have this as broadly uh, applied as possible. So Europe, for example, the EU is taking TCFD as the basis for their new mandatory uh, climate disclosure requirements, uh, which is working its way through the European legislative uh, process. Um, and we are also working with the global standard setters to try to get a, a comprehensive approach. So all of these approaches should start to uh, start to move together. Um, and, um, and, you know, New Zealand's leadership on this is important, but also companies and providers of capital feeding in uh, to help with the refinements. So uh, I wouldn't call it TCFD light the tcfd right if you will um so that if there are some tweaks that should be made to it let's let's make them now as they as, as they get mapped in thanks thanks mark um i think we've got time for one more question angie may I, um circle back to you thank you mark if I could. So, latest government figures in pre COVID 19, 7% for New Zealand business, only 28% of New GDP, and 5% if you include this. And we know that economic activity is contribution emissions significantly. Frameworks today for large business entities and it's involved to the net zero. And this means especially planning what it takes to get within and businesses is overwhelming. Uh, we know that uh, this one has to be working on this. I mean, others got some. Sorry, Andrew. Andrew, if you can hear me, I'm sorry that the line is very poor um, and we missed your question. I might um, just ask Matt if you could jump in um, and, uh, and take over on the question. Sure. Um, sorry, I thought I'd, I'm glad that wasn't just the point of internet. Okay. Um, uh, I've got a question for Adrian because I don't want him feeling left out. He's the youngest of three boys uh, and so we need to make sure he's, he's included. Uh, you talked a bit about um, about this the the need to change decisions. Um, imagine we had uh, waved the wand and uh, Minister Shaw and Mark got their wish, and we had perfect climate disclosure around our private and our public companies here in New Zealand. What what do you think makes it sufficient? What you know we've moved from necessary, which is we've got the data, to sufficient. How, you know what what are the things that are getting in the way of that? Because I think that's the that's the next step for us. Yeah, I mean, it's um, thanks, thanks, Matt. I don't feel left out. Um, uh, a big question. You know, this this really is is the uh, necessary, well, short of sufficient. It's putting the information on the table. It's allowing investors, consumers to actually start to operate with the data. It's allowing firms to manage 
um, the risks. Uh, and so it's letting the relative prices, as I mentioned, start to do their role. That's the first part. The second part, of course, is I think it's just going to run into lots of other corner solutions where, for example, the world of uh, accounting and IFRS is all too short term too often. There is not enough ability for uh, firms to take really long term decisions. It's very hard for investors to reap rewards that might be 30 years apart. So it will force change in, I would say, the horizon over which uh, business is done. As long as a lot of the climate change risk is considered an externality, it's not going to be properly managed, even with the relative price. So there's still going to be a role for regulation and a better role, um, a, a role for thinking long term, you know, for really making that difference. If you think beyond three to five years, then there are no externalities. Everything related to social cohesion, environmental sustainability, cultural inclusion, all come into the equation of am I being a good citizen? Is my product sustainable? Are my profitable profits for the long term and real economic profits? Thank you, Adrian. Um, we've run out of time, so I'm, I'm sorry we have to draw the session to an end. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Wendy, to close. Hey, kona mai kakite. Thank you very much. A um, fascinating discussion. I um, want to shout out, obviously, to Minister Shaw for that um, announcement around the External Reporting Board. Um, as an accountant in my early years, um, I really thoroughly endorse that um, announcement. Um, I know that it will be very welcome. Um, I think one of the things for me is understanding that TCFD, um, dare I say, was born out of the Financial Stability Board and Mark Carney's work. Um, so um, a shout out to you on that. I, I, I don't know how hard it must have been to deliver it, but um, it is a very clever document and I think it's very simple to use and I really admire it. Um, I see it as a, um, a little bit of, um, you know, the birth. I see that we're going through the teenage years um, and now we're moving into adulthood where we actually need to embed TCFD into the normal way that we operate and think about risk. There's not many positive things that can come out of COVID, but one of the things is actually understanding the relationship between the scenario analysis that we learn and apply around climate change can actually apply across all risks. So what we're doing is actually upskilling the businesses, the countries and the planet to actually understand foresight and apply it and to feed, use reporting to feed into foresight. So um, I like to think of um, reporting, foresight and strategy are three um, areas that we need to work on together to align to create the kind of future that we want. Um, now, look, I want to do um, a very quick thank you. Obviously, um, um, CDSB, um, Simpson Grierson and ourselves um, have worked together um, and I'm very thankful. But we've also had quite a big supportive team around us and I really wanted to just acknowledge and say thank you to all those people. And now I'm going to move to our speakers. Um, what I'd like to do is first really acknowledge um, the two representatives from two large financial institutions, um, and that's um, obviously Matt and Angela. Um, you're leading institutions, and most importantly, you're leading in the space. And I know I'm with a lot of New Zealanders, if not all New Zealanders, and saying thank you very much for doing that. Um, Martine, um, your team at Pollination Group, oh my gosh, they've been so amazing to take on this challenge and then actually to be able to deliver, it actually has been about the team at Pollination. So big shout out to them and thank you for offering that and um, for allowing us to, if you like, use those services in the complimentary way that you have it means a great deal to us. And to me personally, it helped me sleep at night, I might add. Um, now, uh, Marty, um, Marty and I, of course, um, met in a very noisy cafe in London in July, and my gosh, um, a lot has happened since then. Um, I want to um, thank you for all the wisdom that you have shared and the knowledge and your energy and your vision. 
Um, I also want to thank you for the wonderful um, Michael Zimoni, who you know came to New Zealand and ran the TCFD workshops with Simpson Grierson and ourselves. Um, he made it sound so simple and easy. And when people ask detailed, in depth questions, he was able to answer them so comprehensively. It was, we were bowled over. <clears throat> Very impressive. Um, now that leaves us um, with our three stars. And um, I'm afraid, gentlemen, we have called you our stars um, when we've been organizing this. Um, Minister Shaw, I have been so impressed how you've been able to navigate this very difficult conversation. Um, COVID, the solution is science, it's a vaccine. Climate change, there is no vaccine. And that makes it really challenging because it means it's a public policy solution. And you need to navigate that landscape, both by sort of gently pulling us forward, but also being very responsive and listening. And I have to say, um, I really like that combination. It's, it's rare and it's rare in a politician. And I really just wanted to acknowledge that as you go forward. And can I thank you um, deeply around the XRB, because when I talked about adulthood for TCFD, the only home for that is the external reporting board. And that type of leadership um, that's on that board at the moment is able to, I actually think, deliver something quite special, Mark Carney. So please watch that space, the New Zealand XRB. So um, thank you very much. Um, Adrian. Oh my gosh, you entered the climate change space very early on. Um, it would be at least 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I, I'm always impressed by your um, evidence-based approach. Um, you're very practical and you're very humble. And those are exactly the traits that we need as the head of our major financial institution in New Zealand. Um, and um, I'm... Um, so pleased to see that leadership that's coming from you. So thank you very much. I mentioned three stars. Well, of course, um, I'm sorry, Mark, again, but we've called you the rock star. So I'm sure that's not the only <laughs> time. And that's, and that's largely, the TCFD has been so important. Um, your contribution um, and your legacy to the world. Um, and, I, and I'm not trying to overplay it. It's just that actually, it's been so important. And I have to say, I was looking for something and TCFD meant so much because it gave us an opportunity. It opened, you actually put something on top of the whole reporting infrastructure and you can, you know, you positioned it so cleverly uh, for someone that understands the framework. That positioning was very excellent. And I know there was a whole lot of people to that, but you started that by starting that committee. So thank you. Um, the second thing I really wanted to thank you for, Mark, is your interest in New Zealand. We are a very small country. We, um, we, we're very isolated in many ways. Um, we try and hang out with all the cool people around the planet and we travel madly and we love the world and we love our overseas trips. Um, and of course, love um, London and Canada and all these interesting places. Um, but your interest in us is just so special for us that it enabled us to have this event um, and got all this interest. And um, I just wanted to really thank you and make you aware of that. Now, um, Mark, who spoke at the beginning, um, he um, gave the wonderful explanation for why a near horizon. Um, Trevor Moki, who he mentioned, the concept was that the responsibility for bringing the horizon nearer to us is ours alone. And I think that's probably a very good sort of place um, to leave this. Um, so um, his proverb was for the near horizon and opportunities seize them. Um, it is a gift from the voice of the land of New Zealand to you, Mark Carney. And um, we hope that it goes well with you and, uh, going forward and we would love to um, continue that dialogue. And so I'm just going to close by speaking um, the um, proverb in Māori. So, kona pai tata, whakau moa 
um, Katina. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening and contributing. And may the dialogue go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy.